All right, guys, welcome back to another one of our vlogs. First and foremost, I want to thank you guys for following our channel and for subscribing. We have gotten so many positive comments recently about our content and about the videos that we've been making. So uh, we feel really energized and uh, really grateful for watching and for staying tuned. In this video, I want to share with you guys a little bit about how I became a neurosurgeon and in the process, help answer some of your questions that you've had for us on our channel. So I'm going to take you around with me throughout the day and show you, you know, kind of what I do during the day. And also in between while I have breaks, answer some of the questions that you guys have had about each step of the way, including all the steps from undergrad, medical school and residency and everything along the way. So if you have any questions, make sure you stay tuned and hope you find this video helpful. Thanks. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed some of the footage from the OR and surgical equipment. I finished my first surgery of the day and have a little bit of break between cases. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about as an undergraduate student, what you can do to prepare for a career in neurosurgery. The first step of the way is obviously going to be from undergrad applying and getting acceptance into medical school. Undergrad is typically a four year course of study in which you will choose a various one of the various undergraduate majors but also align with your goal of becoming a medical student uh, so you'll have to do a pre-med curriculum most people who are interested in medical school and becoming doctors end up doing a undergraduate course of study in biology as their major however there are many medical students who have majored in other things within the sciences typically such as chemistry biomedical engineering and molecular genetics the pre-med track includes courses including anatomy and physiology, including infectious disease, uh, microbiology, and other courses which you'll need as prerequisites for medical school. Additionally, like organic chemistry, uh, molecular genetics, those sorts of things. But pre-med is not a major in and of itself. In your undergraduate coursework, it's very important to have a good, strong GPA. The average GPAs of people entering medical school are like 3.75. However, you know, it's always encouraged to be above the median GPA, above the median MCAT scores in order to be as competitive as you can for medical school. In addition to a good strong coursework and GPA, you'll need to score well on the MCAT to gain admission to medical school. The MCAT is typically taken in your third or fourth year of undergrad and the average score tends to be 515, 516. Most people to have a good shot of matriculating and gaining admission to medical school should be a little bit higher than the median metrics. For me, I was actually quite fortunate. I was enrolled in a BSMD program at Ohio State University in which I, I gained acceptance to the medical school um, along with my acceptance to undergraduate's course of study as part of a BSMD combined program. So I didn't have to take the MCAT. And in its place, I was able to focus my efforts on things like volunteering, things like research, community outreach, being involved in pre-med kind of curriculum. These are still highly encouraged and almost required for many medical schools uh, to really strengthen your application as an undergrad. So it's very important to engage yourself in volunteering experiences such as the Red Cross, such as hospital volunteering and to gain experience to the medical field. And also to show to the admissions committee that you're involved with your community, that you want to do well for the community and for others around you. So with that, it's time for my next case. I'm gonna go scrub in and get ready for that and I'll check in with you guys later. Now quickly before I go, one thing to keep in mind as an undergraduate student, even if you're interested in neurosurgery or interested in any other specific specialty, is that the faculty who are interviewing you in the medical school are not necessarily going to be from that discipline and are not necessarily going to share the same excitement with you as a particular field. So 
It's important to keep your application very broad as an undergraduate student. You don't want to show your interviewers and show the people on the medical admissions committee that you're only interested in medicine for one particular specialty because that may limit your chances of getting acceptance to medical school. So it's important, again, to keep your application broad Explore the specialty that you might have in mind, but also always tell faculty and any admissions committee people when you're interviewing that, you know, remind them that it is early and that you are open to learn about everything and excited to learn about all aspects of medicine. And as it turns out, many people in medicine come into medical school thinking one specialty and end up applying and getting acceptance to residency in a different field than what they initially thought when they came into school. So always keep your options open. Don't limit yourself in terms of your application because you never know who's going to be interviewing you. All right, so it's about 12.30 now. Uh, I just took a little bit of a break for lunch. I uh, wanted to talk to you about what you can do during your time in med school to help you prepare for a career in neurosurgery. So I would recommend even as a first year medical student, you should contact the neurosurgery department leaders, the program director, the chairman, uh, some of the faculty in the department and express your interest in the field early. They can help get you involved in things that are gonna be critical for applying to neurosurgery, such as letters of recommendation, research, and shadowing opportunities. For neurosurgery, I recommend getting involved in research as early as you can. Now, the average number of publications and research experiences for a person matching into neurosurgery is 10 to 15. So really getting involved in research, showing that you're interested in the basic sciences um, is gonna be very important for your application. In addition to doing research, you should be attending things like neurosurgery grand rounds where you'll gain exposure to a variety of things within the subspecialties and really kind of expand your breadth of the field. So when you're shadowing and scrubbing in, you're able to understand what's going on and able to ask pertinent questions. Later in med school, during your third and fourth year, you're gonna to have to take your USMLE step exams. Now step one has been converted to pass fail, so you must pass this on your first try. Step two is gonna be utilized now more and more in my opinion as the benchmark in which candidates are compared to one another from various institutions. So it is gonna become more important than it has been in the past. So it's important that you take your step two earlier so that it shows up on your application when it comes to application time, as well as you must score well on that exam to have a good chance for neurosurgery. You should also aim to honor or letter your rotations, meaning you score in the high percentile of those rotations. And in order to do that, you have to have good performance on both your clinical exams and in your clinical evaluations. So it's very important that you're able to do both of those things well on every rotation so you can aim to achieve honors or letters in your clinical rotations. For neurosurgery, we recommend doing at least one to two away rotations and these are sort of audition rotations in which you can really get the opportunity to show whichever programs you might be interested in going, show them your interest in person, communicate with them, gain some additional experience, and just get your name out there. These away rotations are very important because you always get a time to give a Grand Rounds lecture. So usually these will last you know, 10 to 15 minutes in which you should have a well thought out, nicely organized presentation about some sort of a clinical or basic science research project that you have done throughout your medical school or undergraduate studies that you can talk eloquently and discuss about. And lastly, submitting ERAS is gonna be the last step for you as a medical student in order to apply for residency. So you have to make sure that your application is in on time, meaning the first day that the application is open, you should submit it and make sure all of your letters are in from all of the various institutions that you have done away rotations at, as well as your home institution and your complete CV is updated. So everything should be squared away and ready to submit on the day that the applications open. 
and finally booking the interview. So this is very exciting part. Once you get those emails that come into your inbox, you should try to respond to those right away. The interviews get taken up and they fill quickly. So you might not get the, the dates that you want. You might not get the time slots that you're available for unless you schedule those interviews right away. It has happened that people have got accepted for interview. However, they responded too late to the email or they saw that email too late. And then by the time they got the opportunity to fill out a time slot, those were all taken. And so they essentially missed out an interview opportunity. So with that, let's go get a coffee and we'll continue our chat. Alright, so I just picked up a coffee and um, just got a call for a patient to, uh, that we're consulted on now. It's a patient who has a new third nerve palsy. Um, so for neurosurgeons, that can be concerning for a PCOM aneurysm, or basically an aneurysm of one of the blood vessels in the brain that can cause uh, pressure and compression on a nerve, resulting in a third nerve palsy. Uh, so I'm going to go and evaluate the patient and then uh, uh, look through all the imaging and talk to the attending and then after we do all that I will uh, check in back with you later. Alright so I finished my consult and uh, went to see the patient. We had a patient who were concerned about having an aneurysm uh, although the imaging was negative uh, they did have concern for third nerve palsy uh, which can be a concerning sign for aneurysm. Um, however, the, the way that this presentation occurred, it seemed very low likelihood and given the negative imaging, uh, we think it's likely due to another source such as microvascular disease. So we're still needing to, to work that up uh, in terms of the third nerve finding and then kind of decide on a treatment, but uh, at least as far as neurosurgery goes and no surgery or no intervention that uh, the patient would require. Now that that one's all tucked away, I want to talk to you a little bit about residency and what neurosurgery residency is like. So neurosurgery residency is seven years in total. The uh, years are divided based off of sort of like an intern year and then the junior residency years and then usually in the in the middle of the residency there's a couple of years one or two years for research or extra clinical work and then the the senior and chief years of residency towards the end so at our program the intern year is typically spent learning the floor management of patients and also seeing consults uh, this includes you know any patient who comes into the ER with subdural hematoma, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, as well as numerous different spinal pathologies, traumatic fractures of the spine, disc herniations, spinal cord tumors, uh, spine tumors, and also you know brain tumors. So, so really kind of a, a big spectrum of, of things that we see as, uh, as neurosurgeons. The floor management consists of seeing patients, examining them before surgery and after surgery, making sure that their post-operative care is appropriate, making sure to address any problems or any issues related to surgery, related to wound complications, related to infections that may arise after surgery. In addition, in order to take somebody for surgery, patients have to be safe. So part of intern year is, lear is spent learning how to optimize patients for surgery, how to get them ready, how to get them prepped for surgery uh, to make sure that patients have good outcomes. The second and third year of residency at our program are spent typically in the OR and also doing 24-hour overnight calls as well as seeing consults overnight. And so those are sort of uh, very difficult years and the fact that the, the schedule can be very challenging. Uh, typically, you know, we're on call every third or fourth night. You know, having that irregular schedule can be difficult to maintain a, a good healthy circadian rhythm. 
but that's part of the the residency experience you know that's part of uh, the challenge of, of residency and especially of neurosurgery is in that it's it's seven years it is for a long stretch of time that we have to work uh, these long uh, arduous hours after a third year of residency we began our PGY4 and PGY5 years and typically those are research years or uh, enfolded clinical years in which we can do extra years in doing fellowship and really perfecting a particular subset of neurosurgery. I spent my PGY4 year doing functional neurosurgery. I spent a whole year managing patients with movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease, such as essential tremor, as well as a number of different pain syndromes in which we implant spinal cord stimulators, pain pumps, peripheral nerve stimulators uh, to help manage chronic pain. The other option instead of doing clinical work is to do research which can include either basic science research or clinical research and so some residents elect to do clinical projects in a subspecialty that they're interested in to help build their CV for academic careers and, and for careers in a particular subspecialty that they're interested in. The sixth year is spent doing six months over at uh, Children's Hospital in which we are the acting chief resident of the uh, Pediatric Neurosurgery Service um, and then also six months as one of the chiefs at OSU Maine hospital. And then seventh year is our final year and as our official chief year in which we both manage the clinical services. So we're a chief resident of, of one of the three services that we have. And we also handle all the administrative duties for the entire residency cohort. After completing residency, long, long seven years of training, uh, some residents elect to then undergo additional specialty training uh, in a fellowship in one of their particular areas of interest. These are usually one-year fellowships, but sometimes they can be two years fellowships uh, depending on, on the subspecialty. Other residents who don't elect to do fellowship end up going and, and finding jobs and start working in practice where typically they can do sort of a general neurosurgery which encompasses both brain and spine surgeries. So with that, that wraps up this episode. Hope you're able to find this useful and if you have any questions about the path to becoming a neurosurgeon, let me know. I'm happy to answer any questions. Please like and comment on this video and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Thanks, and hope you guys have a good one. See ya.